Hey everybody, I'm Andres. I'm Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Abe. And that's, that's Abe. Abe. <laughs> and this is Between Two Stands, a show that takes a closer look at the personalities, the big personalities that make up the DSO. <laughs> Uh, so it's as you can tell we've been having a and good I'm time. Abe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there he is. Better late than never. He made it. He made it, everybody. Uh, so as you can tell, we've been having a good time today. Um, and part of the reason for that is our awesome guest that you're about to meet played the game with us. So stay to the end of the interview to see our fun game. Which brings us uh, to the introduction of Jay Ritchie, friend and colleague. Uh, assistant Principal Timpany and Percussionist Jay Ritchie is a native of Blacksburg, Virginia. He began studying piano at the age of 8 and percussion at 11. He received his Bachelor of Music at the Manhattan School and later completed his Master's at the Cleveland Institute of Music. He joined the DSO in 2016 and has also appeared as a guest with some of the most esteemed orchestras in the country. Jay also enjoys teaching privately as well as with the DSO's Youth Ensemble. So without further ado, please welcome Jay and enjoy this performance. Nice job. Very nice, Jay. Okay. <laughs> Sounded Thank awesome. You. Yeah, that was, that was just a little uh, project I was doing over the winter. Um, the Snow is Dancing by Debussy um, from Children's Corner. So, you know, seasonal. We had a really snowy winter, so it was like, felt cozy to be playing that one. And it wasn't really, you know, high quality recording. There were a couple notes in there, too. So sorry about that. That, that wasn't originally intended for for broadcast, but uh, thought people would enjoy. 
Yeah. Uh, so we all know that that's your that's your worst stuff. That's as bad as it gets. Oh, that's that was the, the, yeah, absolutely. The intonation on that bottom. was a little. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's like it, it was kind of cool, like to see people, um, you know, find projects for themselves. Uh, this this you know being cooped up, you know, um, just kind of seeing what people created. So. Uh, yeah, that was very cool, man. It sounded really awesome. And uh, so you said it was originally for uh, for piano, obviously, right? And and you trans transcribed it. Yeah, yeah. I kind of took the. I just took a little time and went through each movement of Children's Corner, and was like, can I do this on marimba or no? You know. And they were kind of like, I think there's six total. Uh, maybe four of the six I deemed playable. Um, one of the one of them actually works better on vibes with sustain, yeah. you know. Oh, cool. um, but yeah, it's like it's kind of fun for us to mess. I mean, Andres, as you know, like we just don't have repertoire from pre, you know, nineteen fifty right. for solo <laughs> percussion. Right, so right. If we want to play older music, it's got to be transcription. And, and a lot of it of works. Fun. A lot of it really does work. Um, but yeah. it, it, you know, for for people who don't you know know that connection like i always explain like you know the reason why it's difficult even though the marimba or the vibraphone look like a piano it's kind of like you you can only play with four fingers <laughs> you know and so that's why you know you can't really do all those all those uh crazy um yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. imagine playing the piano like this and then that's why it's hard <laughs> but no that sounded great man that sounded really really good um, thanks yeah so I've actually, I've, I think that uh, I have a good idea. We should put up a picture every time a percussion instrument is mentioned for the people that don't know. So, so far we've got marimba and vibes. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> so, but that brings us to a little bit of like what your job is, Jay. Can you like explain to us a little bit about what your responsibilities in the orchestra might be? Yeah, my job's a lot of fun. Um, so I'm assistant principal timpani and section percussion, so kind of a dual role. And uh, I always say I have the distinction of, I don't want to say I play more instruments than anyone in the orchestra, because I don't know what everyone plays, but in my job description, there are more <laughs> instruments than anyone else in the orchestra. Because, you know, like Andres' job description is infinity instruments, right? All the <laughs> percussion instruments, it can be anything you hit, except timpani. And so mine is infinity plus one with symphony <laughs> added. Ah, <laughs> uh, Jay wins. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a question about that. Like with the percussion instruments, it's sort of like anything goes. In a lot of the modern music, it's like car parts and you're banging on them, and yeah. uh, or the or yeah the lines we, roar. We, we, which we is still have car favorite. parts from a, a previous piece in the yeah. <laughs> Or like Gershwin, you're playing car horns, like actual. <laughs> so, are are there any that are more fun than others? Is there something that y'all enjoys playing? Is there a composer that writes really well for certain instruments or better? And like as a timpanist, I mean, Andres, I'm sure you have some experience playing timpani, but like as Jay in that assigned role, like how are all these things different? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's it's a it's a complicated thing, but in a way it's very simple because like on on any percussion instrument, you have the same concepts of like you approach, you, you the mallet interacts with the surface and you follow through, you know? So it's like, that's how I try to keep it simple across the board with, with just like thinking of it the same way. And then there's all these little details that you have to worry about differently on each instrument. Um, I, for me, I love playing timpani. That's probably like was my my natural kind of like the one that I latched onto first. Um, but but I love the variety too, you know. And I mean, sometimes you know we we get a little uh, tired of of some of the jokes when we have to play slide whistle and and that kind of silly stuff. But um, so I'm not going to stop making the jokes. No, I mean, <laughs> fine. You know, it's, it's like, like we, we think it's silly too, you know? Um, but in fact, actually, you said car parts. Like my water bottle right now is sitting on a brake drum that I've been, this is like the brake drum of a car that yeah. I've been using for a Can you play that? Practice. Can you just play that? Yeah, it's just, it's basically an anvil kind of sound, you know? Um, 
I'm sure your neighbors love that. Nice. Oh, they love it. Yeah, <laughs> I get compliments on the brake drumming in particular. We love well, the tone. While you're while you're there though, can you switch sticks? Do do different sticks make different sounds on that? Like if you use a softer. Yeah, I mean, I would. Probably... You've got a whole array of things there. Yeah, well, this is yeah, this is the mallet, the home mallet rack. So this is actually the B set. Everything else is at work. Um, <laughs> but like a metal sound, you know, metal on metal is going to be like I don't know if you can hear that very well, but it's a real harsh metallic thing. But then you could hit it with like a, a wrapped marimba mallet, and it's a much much more like legato kind of sound. Jay, I'm going to take it a step further here. We did this with with Sarah, the oboe, her her oboe um, area. Can you just give us like a little tour of that room? Because that's a very cool <laughs> setup. Is it possible, or like, can you like swivel the computer a little bit? It's it's logistically possible, but everything except this corner is really disorganized right now. So <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna um, okay 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 pass. I'm gonna play the fifth on that. Okay one. okay, yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> I, I do you, do you make your own mallets? Um, I don't usually make them from scratch, but um, I definitely rewrap all my timpani mallets with felt. Um, okay. So that takes some like arts and crafts sewing kind of skills. And I've messed around a little bit with wrapping the yarn marimba mallets, but it's it's a lot of work, and they don't they last longer. So I usually just don't worry about it as much there. But um, but yeah, I mean, I can give you a little tour that, like, yeah, this just, is my xylophone, you know, and right. that's the one instrument that's uncovered and not uh, covered in, like, books right now. Um, <laughs> but that's a, it's a Deegan 870, which Andres is the only one that knows what that means, but it's a, an old xylophone from the 20s. Um, yeah. And then uh, that, so this picture right here is, that's the program from my first classical week with the DSL. Um, but I, I, yeah, yeah, those sticks, just the way you had those sticks is very cool too. Just like, you know, just the setup. Yeah, there. it's easy to see everything. It's just like a simple, you know, uh, wire shelving kind of thing. But you yeah. can fit them through there. And I've got triangles, tambourines, like extra heads. This is just the storage space. Yeah. So, and then you can probably recognize some of the folks in that picture. Um, that's our, our section at the end of the, the China tour. Oh, that's why we were yes. looking a little haggard. It was the end of the China, China tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, the thing is, it's a good thing it's not like a smellable picture because it was so hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're not fresh tuxedos. <laughs> so, so I'm actually curious about this, Jay. Like, you know, even though they're they're – relatively similar um you know instruments i feel like the roles are very different you know timpani and percussion and so i was wondering like you know there are times where you'll play timpani on one half and percussion on another half do you have to kind of like mentally switch gears or 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 do you kind of prepare differently for those concerts or um do you kind of look at it the same yeah i mean i guess for me in terms of the, the physicality of the playing, like I was saying, I try to think of it conceptually as all related, so it's not such a big transition, and that helps me smooth things out. Um, the biggest difference is just timpani is the only instrument I play that we have to tune as we play. Mm -hmm. You know, everything else is like, it might be pitched, but you, to tune it, you would have to take sandpaper to it. Um, you know, so and it only goes so one we, direction when you do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the biggest adjustment I think is if I if I play timpani on a program and then switch to percussion, it's a relatively easy switch. But the challenging ones for me are when I have to go from like playing some, for example, some loud cymbal crashes, which kind of like rattle your brain a little bit. And then go right over. Maybe next, I'm playing timpani on the concerto, and I have to like tune and and like play softly and in tune. And it's like a real kind of shift of how I'm using my ears, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. I do I do practice like the intonation aspect a lot. Um, and we also at the DSO, Jeremy and I use um, we use calf timpani heads, calf skin, and so those are. Uh, affected a lot by the humidity and depending on 
the, the details of what's going on with the AC or the heat and the weather and whatever. It can be easy, either an easy day for you or a really rough ride, you know? So yeah. if I, if Jeremy's been playing them and then I have to like step in without knowing what they've been doing, those are some of the more challenging moments for me. So, Intermission is usually a pretty tough time for a stage because the, the the front of the house is open, right? Yeah, things can change during the show, and you know, even the the difference between the lights. Like, <laughs> I always hate it when they they show a little video on the projector before the show because the lights go way down, and the, the even in the like course of the three or four minute video. The heads will react to that, and then it's like, oh boy, we're in for we're in for a change here. You know? <laughs> so do you are you, do other orchestras use calfskin heads for timpani as well, or or do some use plastic to help mitigate, or is there diff, are there different materials you can use to help mitigate sort of weather issues? Yeah, I mean, plenty of people use both, and we and we actually do use plastic also when we're um, when we're playing pop stuff we feel like we're normally playing louder and it's less about the like warmth of the sound and more about the like bold brashness of the sound. And so then we don't want to, because the calf heads are very expensive. So we use okay. plastic to save a little bit there. Um, and it is, yeah, it's a little more, you still have to be adaptive, but it's not as, as crazy of a ride with the, as it is with the calf heads. Um, so yeah, I mean, in a way, we're making it hard on ourselves by choosing to use calf, but the the tone quality is just so much warmer and more beautiful. So, one interesting aspect of the percussion section is when you're playing all those different instruments, they respond sort of differently. Like if you're hitting that break drum, it's it is such an instant reaction to the sound and the timpani definitely, or the bass drum, for example, has like um, a softer articulation mm -hmm. depending on how you're playing it. And I'm just wondering like, are all of you watching the conductor and reacting hopefully at the same time to make, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, feel free to plead the fifth on this, but like as a section, especially a section with like sort of two acting principal players at the same time, how do you negotiate when those things happen? And how, do you work within, are you kind of making sure that it's working as a unit there or is it everyone for themselves? <laughs> um, I think, I don't know. I mean, Andres, I think we try to visually check in a little bit, even if it's just peripherally, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, you know, you know, I, I, I would, I always say the, the biggest challenge uh, that I've experienced is is placement um, because you you really can't go with your ear a lot of times like you know our the hall is I mean it's obviously incredible but just because it's the shape and and the way you know the acoustics are you if you hear something you play with it it's too late because the sound travels back and then you react and the sound travels forward. So you have to very much anticipate, the, you know, what you're playing to where it almost sounds like you're playing early. And that, that's been a huge challenge um, still, you know, um, and, it's, and it's certain instruments. In fact, it, it, this isn't the same for everywhere, but like uh, the higher pitched instruments, tambourine, triangle, glockenspiel, snare drum, just the, the higher frequency, those seem to just travel late later for some reason so um it, it, it is a balance of playing with everyone um but if you're especially if you're playing alone you really have to anticipate those those instruments in particular otherwise like it sounds late even though it, even though it's not you know um yeah so, so yeah i would say like when we're playing something that's kind of a full section we're playing together that's great because we can kind of like lock in together, lay down the law, and the rest of the orchestra is going to get on board, you know? But the, the most challenging times are definitely like, like you, like you said, like different instruments respond differently, have different um, kind of immediacy to them, you know? And so you have to know that and you have to know who you're playing with and whether it's, it's going to be an articulation that is really immediate, or if you have to blend with a legato articulation, that can be challenging for a 
percussive instrument, you know. So, yeah, it's just always moment to moment. It's different. And, well, and so just, that's that, go ahead. and that's all before we even try and figure out if we're playing with the conductor or behind the conductor. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Because for some conductors, it's like the the way that they're that they're conducting the orchestra responds afterwards sometimes, or that they're just conducting ahead to make sure that they're communicating what they want. Whereas in something like I don't know, right a spring, right, it's probably going to be pretty immediate in some of the more rhythmic sections. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, and I mean, oh sorry. Well, part of the reason I bring this up is because it seems like there's always this conflict with every orchestra of like. The leader of the orchestra, whether it's the conductor or the concertmaster, whoever up front, has to lead the sections that are far behind them when the sound is traveling toward the audience from the back. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of this always checking in in both directions that has to happen. And right. that can, yeah, it's, it's unusual when you're on especially the extreme ends of those. And that's why like sitting in a different part of the stage is actually really illuminating because the sound is just different there it just even if you're like if you move five ten feet over it's it's a totally different experience you know like i remember sitting with the horns one time uh and i'm like this is this is interesting this is cool this is this is very different you know this is so much better than anything i've ever experienced why is that why is it so so i love that's another reason i love playing timpani because i get to sit right behind scott's bell just blasting me yeah <laughs> So, it's, so, it's a mutual appreciation. <laughs> so, so, so this this episode is airing on Monday, uh, but today's Thursday, and we're playing the the uh, percussion concerto today. Uh, but when this airs, it'll you know we will have played it already, and uh, so check it out because it's cool. Uh, but um, that's 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 kind of a cool uh, you know break from what we normally do because it's just us and um it's kind of like uh it's very it's a very sonically interesting piece um and we don't necessarily have to worry as much about placing it with 70 other 80 other people uh but um yeah that, that's just kind of a cool example of of some of the sounds that that can be made you know um with with, with these instruments so um yeah check that out for sure it's 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 it, i mean are, are you liking that playing that jay yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because it looks so simple on the page, you know, it's like very uh, kind of minimal in a way and very repetitive. But when we played it together yesterday for the first time, it was like cool how things like ebb and flow and lock in together and then don't and, and you know, well, hopefully lock in together. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and we're like putting out some sound too there's some like triple and quadruple f markings yeah. in there so it's it's fun yeah he, he, he the um nagano the conductor uh said he programmed it because it well, the piece was written uh for the nuclear disaster that happened you know with the earthquake in, in in um in japan but he thought it was appropriate with just all the stuff going on with the world right now and, and feeling like stifled and and um and having you know all the, I don't know, there, there's this pandemic happening. I don't know if we all knew about that, but, um, you know, he thought it was just are an you appropriate... Saying, are you saying these times are unprecedented? Uh, unprecedented times, <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, anyway, uh, check it out. It, it, it should be should be interesting. Um, but, um, so anyway, Jay, breaking away from music for a second, uh, you've been really into rowing and snowshoeing or and also uh, cross-country skiing right have you taken that up yeah so well the it, so i haven't done snowshoeing but the i'll get into the cross-country skiing who does that, the research for this show like a, andres no that was abe's question <laughs> <laughs> i would never i would never ask about snowshoeing <laughs> <laughs> tell us about how you put your shoes on no i'm just kidding uh, no sorry, sorry go ahead <laughs> um, yeah, but no, the rowing thing has been a, a fun uh, activity I've been into for a few years now. Um, I sort of, it wasn't a thing that was on my radar growing up. I know in some areas it is, but just like where I grew up, it wasn't, it wasn't really a thing. Um, but then I, so I went to undergrad at Manhattan School of Music, and while I was there, I had a gym membership for the Columbia Gym which uh, Columbia University has like one of the most 
epic famous crew programs ever and so i would always see those guys like in there on the rowing machines just like going for it and it looked really cool um so i kind of started dabbling around with it and i i never really learned how to do it right until um until i'm i got the job here and my first summer i actually like took a took a learn to row class and like got out on the water doing it and it's just like it's an amazing thing just to be able to like it's the best full body workout of anything i've ever done and it's also you're like out on the water and it's gorgeous and it's just like it can be like a beautiful almost spiritual kind of thing you know um I remember so, the only problem is you got to wake up really early when the water's glassy. I remember there was yeah. like a few weeks there where you you woke up at like five a.m. and you're like, "Yeah, dude, I, did, I just uh, yeah." yeah. <laughs> like, Are you okay? I, I've stopped doing the really early morning rows. I did that one summer, um, and it's just I mean, being out on the water at five a.m. is a beautiful thing, but it's not compatible with playing concerts at eight p.m. three nights a week. You know, and I right. just could not get a reliable <laughs> sleep schedule to where I, yeah. I yeah, it was rough. I was but, worried uh, about you there for a bit. Yeah, I, I definitely like aged a couple years in that one summer. But um, <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like having a kid, right? Yeah, I, I, it's, I mean, you can speak to that, not me. But yeah, yeah. It, does, it does probably have some similarity. Um, yeah. One thing I want to ask about the rowing, like, is it? the physical motion that you enjoy and the workout aspect of it and being on the water, or are you like moving at a s speed that is like exciting and enjoyable across the water as well? Like what is it? Is there something to that? How fast do you think you're going? In other words, uh, how many knots? I mean, how many knots? Yeah, it's not anywhere close to like, like speed boat speed or anything. It's well, not no, like no. Speed thrill, you know, but if you're, if but you're if in you're like, like powering yourself and kind of skimming and like I could totally understand how that would be like kind of great if you can yeah. feel a breeze I mean it really feels right you, you glide nicely and it's it's a beautiful thing for that, sure and there's also I, like there's a rhythmic aspect of it too that kind of ties in with with what I do you know like whether you're alone or especially if you're coordinating in a boat with multiple people and timing everything together and finding the pacing and there's also even for me like the touch of the blade on the water is almost like parallel to the the stick on the drum head or something like there's there's some kind of leverage parallel there um so yeah this is the the stuff that i think about when i'm out there and just kind of like have fun you know it's kind of it's meditative too very nice well I'm, yeah. I, if you need a coxswain i'll be there for you yeah uh, yeah that'd be great <laughs> Faster, um, yeah. That's why I enjoy uh, cycling too, personally. Just because, like, you see so much more. You know, um, you go, right. you go fast, and, and and you can you can see a lot more, and um, uh, with relatively less pain than like running. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, but just in um, a different place. Right. Exactly. Exactly. A more a, a duller pain. And then um, yeah, and then you started doing cross country skiing too, right? Yeah, and that, I mean, I don't even know, like, especially here in Michigan, there are probably a lot of people that are that are way more into that and know a lot more than I do. But I just sort of this winter, um, you know, we had a little more time on our hands than usual, and it was a real snowy winter, um, looking for stuff to do outside despite it being really cold, you know. So, um, but there's actually, like, some of the metro parks have nice, nice courses, so... Um, it was a cool way to get out there, and I mean, I'm I'm still like working on the technique and stuff. It's it's tricky, but um, but it was it's it's not because I had done a little downhill skiing growing up, but it's not really like that at all. Like it's it's almost much more like just going for a jog, except you're in the snow. You know, like you're you're out there for a workout, and it's hard work too. Um, but it's beautiful to be out there in the winter and leaves off the trees you can see wildlife a lot and like you know it was kind of a cool thing so i'm gonna hopefully keep that going i can imagine well, it's probably less crowded as well in the winter like i i don't know you're probably seeing other other skiers and everything but 
compared to the summer when there's bikes everywhere and people swimming and all that, I would imagine. Is it yeah. a little more peaceful, secluded? Some, I mean, it depends when and where, you know, but there are definitely like, the, there are groomed tracks for the skis and stuff. So like, the, and I don't know if there were more than this summer. I suspect there were because there are more this winter. I suspect there were because there were a lot of people like me that were like trying it for the first time, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you see people, but it's definitely like peaceful for sure. Well, hey, Jay, uh, I mean, just as a testament to like uh, how small a music world is, uh, Jay and I went to uh, uh, the same music program when we were like, <laughs> when we were kids, you know, we were like in high yeah. school or whatever. And uh, uh, I, 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 which one was it? Uh, there's this one in Maryland. It was it was just for percussion, actually. Um, and uh, I forgot we weren't roommates, but I think we were in the same suite. And I, I just same remember yeah. um, I remember you you sounded insanely good. And I remember coming home being like, that kid was really good. I, I need to start practicing more. Um, <laughs> and and now we're I, and now we're working together, which is it's just kind of yeah. crazy how that works. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it's a small world. Yeah, I remember actually my. I don't remember this, but my parents always told me because I was very young when we when we met that summer. I, I was like, I think going into freshman year of high school, so I just finished eighth grade. And Andres is you're what like three years older than me or something. Yeah. Um, and so uh, my parents said they always tell this story that like they were helping me move in for the week to the dorm, and you were in the suite, like you uh -oh. said. And you like saw me, and they heard you say like, "How young do they let kids in here?" No, I didn't say that. Did I? <laughs> oh God, that sounds like something Andres would say. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I completely believe that story. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, well, I didn't mean it that way, but. Uh, oh no, it, it, yeah. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm, glad, I'm glad I could finally apologize for that. Well, hey, before <laughs> before we head out, uh, I, didn't, I I'm, didn't hear it. I'm sorry. What? Abe, uh, before, before, before we head out, I, we want to do uh, bring back the game, the terms of endearment that Scott coined. So, um, thanks for not taking any credit for that, that title. <laughs> it's the game where we have we have uh, it's like it's like balderdash. We have one real <laughs> definition of words we've never heard of, and two fake ones submitted by the other players. So. Uh, you, you'll have to guess uh, which one's the real one. And I'll keep points. And Jay, you're up, man. Okay. So these are, uh, yeah, just, just you, you have to choose which one is the real one, which one's the fake one. And if you choose one of the other guys, they get a point. Okay. And uh, I apologize for any music historians out there because I'm definitely going to butcher the pronunciation of these words. So okay. just, uh, yes. yeah. So uh, the first word is barcarole. <laughs> B a r c a r o l l e. So first first definition: to relax the tempo. Barcarole, a boating song sung by Venetian gondoliers. Barcarole. A smoky, wispy sound. You know, I, I actually think I know this one. Um, I think it's, believe it or not, it's the Venetian gondolier song. Dude, you're <laughs> right. Nice job. Nice job. Good job for being educated. I was thinking Barca Lounger in my definition. That's why I used to relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, it helps to, like, if, like I, I know a little bit of Spanish and like barco like boat you yeah. know so that i knew that was in there nice yeah, dude nice good <laughs> good job for being educated jay um okay Making me feel stupid <laughs> <laughs> okay here's here's the next word uh theorbo uh the first uh, t-h-e-o-r-b-o first definition precursor to the oboe Second definition, warmly. Third definition, a large lute with the neck extended to carry several long bass strings. Uh, 
Oh man, I that one's got me stumped. Um, what was the first definition again? Precursor to the oboe. Sure, it sounds silly, but why not? <laughs> no, dude, that was Abe's. That was oh, Abe's. Oh, nice. I thought that was <laughs> a- a- Abe's. <laughs> you're, you're def- it's so it's so like literal. It's it's hilarious. The orbo. <laughs> the orbo. <laughs> Oh, sorry. They just they just misspelled oboe. Uh, no, it's it's a large. Well, when loop. they made the real one, they fixed the spelling. So right, right. <laughs> uh, it's a large lute with the neck extended to carry several long bass strings. Um, so now we all know. Now we can all sleep tonight. Um, we apologize to the Fiorbo Players Association <laughs> of the international community. Yeah. Okay. Nice job, Jay. Nice job. Um, okay, Abe, these are, these are yours. Uh, okay. okay. The word is forcing. Not like forcing, but for F-O-R-S-I-N-G. Uh, okay. okay. To exhaust oneself with singing. Technical term for a barbershop quartet. Or you did <laughs> forcing. <laughs> or, <laughs> Are you thought my definitions were literal. Or wow. muted or hushed. <laughs> muted or hushed. Uh, I don't know. Let's go with the last one. Muted or hushed? Yeah. That's Scott's. Nice. Woo! Dude. You didn't buy the barbershop. Forcing, for man. That I was love, I really I love that one because it's like the Orbo, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. We're on the same page. Man, four sing. That is hilarious. <laughs> you guys are you guys are too funny. Um, okay, well it's all tied up. You guys are all at one. Um, okay, so the next word is tamasha. Uh, the definition is hurried or panicked. A grand show, performance, or celebration, especially involving theater or dance. Or a gong scrape with a metal stick. Can you use it in a sentence, please? <laughs> this isn't a spelling bee. This isn't a spelling bee. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of these is the correct definition of Tamasha. Tama- yeah, right. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you, Scott. That's really helpful. Uh, okay, what was the middle one again? A show of performance especially involving theater and dance. Let's go with that one. You got it, dude. That's wow. it. What, what's the origin of that word? Um, I think it's Indian. Okay. Um, okay, dude. So you're in the lead, Abe. You're in the lead. So I might uh, break my losing streak, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I that. that's that's losing streak I, I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for you. Um, Okay, uh, Scott. Ready. Here we go. These are long, long ones here. Okay. Okay, Scott. <laughs> okay, the word is buccin or buccin. B u c c i n. Buccin. A visually distinctive trombone popularized in military bands in France which subsequently faded into obscurity. Ma- uh, the next def- definition is mouthing syllables silently without singing. And the last one is a style of playing found in modern music where one player tries to throw off all the others. The first one. Yep, you got it. You yeah, got it. see, this is this is the, the advantage of being a horn player because in Pines of Rome, the offstage brass, some of them were originally buccin parts. Oh, uh, nice, so nice, nice. if you've ever done that, <laughs> you kind of know. Oh, it's nice. Very, I, I really wanted just my definition to be bronco. I thought of that too, man. I thought of that. And, that, and so, fucking and so, Bronco. Fucking Bronco. And that's why that's why I made my definition that way. 
a little apostrophe. B u c c i n apostrophe. I was really going for the dad joke on that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and the last one is um, the word is odion, and it's uh, the first definition is a former a former cinema chain which was bought out by AMC before the meme stock crisis. <laughs> An ancient Greek right, precursor to the bagpipe, named after the god of foul odors. It was made of sheep organs and emitted a rancid stench when played. And the last one is an ancient Greek building used for musical performances. Uh, you know, it's weird. I'm going with the second one. I want the stink instrument to be the one. <laughs> <laughs> it's an odorous. Uh, <laughs> that was Jay's. That was Jay's. Uh, nice, Jay. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. I, yeah. had the, uh, I had the language origin right. It was Greek. Yeah, it's yeah. the third one, right? Yeah, yeah, it's the third it's one. The third it's the third one. one. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's two all? It's two all, man. Uh, that's... Uh, and and that that's that's all the that's all the words. You guys all tied. I, I, this, is, this is like a millennial's dream. Everyone wins. <laughs> <laughs> wait wait wait! I have to say this is the best Abe has ever done. So yeah, nice job, Abe. <laughs> you tied everybody. <laughs> I, I really liked my cinema complex thing. So yeah, that, that, was, that was a good. That one was really good. That I went really to a few good. of those places back in you know, back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I enjoyed that too. Um, and uh, I, I, yeah, I think my favorite was uh, the, I think yeah, the, the oboe that that got me. That got me. The, the oboe <laughs> and four sing. I think that was a highlight. Four sing. Um, <laughs> well, all right. Nice job, everyone. Thanks for all being winners and losers. Um, and uh, Jay, thanks for joining us, man. It's really nice to talk to you and and uh, you know and uh, get to know you past the stage. You know. Yeah. Thanks, guys. This was fun, and uh, see you soon. Sounds great. All right. Thanks, Jay.